So welcome everyone to this uh, UVA's assessment of China's Belt and Road Initiative speaker series. Uh, my name is Dr. Tayyip Saptar. I'm a postdoc here at the, uh, at the University of Virginia. I'm jointly uh, placed between the East Asia Center and the Department of Politics, and I'm taking care of the assessment of China's Belt and Road Initiative project. Uh, the UVA BRI project is a multi-year initiative, and we are trying to understand what's going on uh, regarding the BRI in different parts of the world. There are a number of different, um, you know, streams that we're taking care of in terms of, you know, the BRI and its impact uh, on the wider world. And one of the main sort of things that we're trying to do is to get information, to get brilliant scholars from across uh, the world to come and talk to us about what's happening with the BRI in different parts of the world because of the multiple implications um, for developing countries uh, across different parts of the world. So today we're extremely lucky to be joined by a brilliant scholar from Pakistan, Dr. Hassan Karar, who's an associate professor at my alma mater, the Lahore University of Management Sciences. He's based at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences. Uh, Dr. Karar has been writing about the borderlands between Central Asia, China, uh, and Pakistan for quite a considerable period of time. Uh, and his research looks at uh, the evolution of this area and the economic and political changes that have taken place in this area, especially since the 1980s with the demise of the Soviet Union uh, and the opening up of China uh, during this period as well. Uh, this is an area which is not very well understood, uh, in all honesty, uh, despite this being one of those critical nodes as far as the ancient uh, Belt and Road Initiative is concerned. Uh, so without further ado, Dr. Karar, over to you. Uh, and just uh, as a side note, as an administrative matter, uh, Dr. Karar will speak for 30 to 45 minutes, and then we'll follow this up with a question and answer session. Uh, please do not use the chat tab. Uh, please raise your hand, introduce yourself, uh, and then ask your question in person. Hassan, a pleasure to have you all and, uh, virtually. Uh, and over to you. Thank you very much for doing this. I know that it's quite late in Pakistan as well. So over to you, Hassan. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Tayyip. Thank you uh, for this for this invitation to uh, share ideas, uh, share some thoughts, uh, sort of you know, sort of delve into some of the research that that I've been uh, building on BRI, especially as it pertains to um, northern Pakistan. Uh, thanks very much, Brian, for facilitating this project as uh, this, this 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 talk as well. It's really uh, much appreciated. Um, just just sort of you know one one. Uh, sort of point that I want to make from the very outset, uh, we, we sometimes have connectivity issues uh, sort of here in Lahore. Uh, and in case we do, in case you lose me uh, for a short while, I'll switch internet connections and I'll be back very, very shortly. Uh, so in case you find that uh, the presentation is lagging or I've <laughs> disappeared from the screen, uh, I, I, I will be back. Uh, but having said that, let me let me begin by pulling up my slides, and then we can get uh, started in earnest. And this is uh, what I will be. Okay, uh, so uh, this is uh, a talk. It's called The Border, a Port, and a Bazaar Parsing BRI from a Distant Corner of Asia. And the distant corner of Asia that I'm referring to is the northernmost part of Pakistan, uh, which is where the Karakoram Mountains are located. And it's here that Pakistan has a land border with uh, China. And what you're seeing on the screen right now is uh, overland trade between China and Pakistan. It might seem a little odd to call this overland trade, given the fact that we have cargo which is loaded onto a boat. Uh, but this particular image was taken at a point in time. Um, specifically, it was taken in 2014, when a portion of the road had disappeared and uh, flood waters had uh, flooded the highway. And for a while, the cargo needed to be transported uh, over water as well. But regardless, 
this is what you would consider overland trade trade that's coming in uh, from uh, Western China into northernmost Pakistan through the Karakoram Mountains uh, over the Karakoram uh, Highway. And the other thing that I want to mention is that this constitutes uh, a very, very, very small portion of Pakistan's trade with China. So the large majority of trade between Pakistan and China is in fact maritime trade uh, from the coastal regions of China uh, to the port of Karachi in southern Pakistan. So uh, we're really talking about a minuscule trade. And that's one of the reasons uh, I'm calling this a distant corner of Asia. And I'll pull up a map in just a, a, a moment. Uh, and it's from this distant corner of Asia uh, that I want to begin parsing uh, both long-term connectivity between the region that is today in Pakistan and what is China on the, on the other side of the border, and also start thinking about BRI. Now, the other thing that I want to say, and this is, this is by way of caveat, and this is by way of backgrounder, uh, these observations are uh, place specific. I think that they have utility in thinking critically about BRI, but uh, sort of to what extent what I'm saying is going to be applicable to other parts of the world is obviously something that would vary from place to place. So I want to underscore the fact that uh, when I talk about BRI in this talk, I'm talking about how I see it from Northern Pakistan. Um, this is uh, essentially what I'm going to be doing today. So, so up here, I've got signposts. You know, this is my way of saying that, look, you know, this is, these are the four parts. Uh, that we'll be covering as far as uh, this talk is concerned. Uh, I'll begin briefly by talking about maps, the utility of these maps, what these maps might tell us. And then of course, uh, the need to uh, move into a map and move away from the map as well. And then once, once I've, I've, I've covered that, uh, I've got three uh, parts of the talk which will follow. Uh, in the first, uh, part of the talk, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, the border between China and Pakistan, I'll talk about connectivity um, through the 20th century. Uh, the second part of the talk is going to be about the dry port, uh, the overland port that's used to process goods that are coming in from China into Pakistan in the Karakoram Mountains. On the left, you have an image of uh, what the Karakoram Mountains might look like. This is an image that's taken in uh, a, a town called Karimabad. And then uh, in the fourth part of the talk, uh, I will situate myself in a border market. Uh, and this border market is located uh, in Pakistan, but it's the first market uh, that you would come to if you're crossing from China into Pakistan. And the question that I want to ask is, well, if we situate ourselves in this border market, what might we be able to say about BRI? What does, what does a bazaar actually tell us? OK, so um, the map on the left is a variation on a map that we've all seen. I think anyone who's worked on BRI, uh, sort of even superficially, would have seen some such map, and I don't want to. I don't want to spend any amount of time uh, analyzing this. Besides saying that this is, it's a, it's a, it's a macro uh, vision of connectivity. It's a, it's a global vision of connectivity, uh, where you have multiple economic corridors which are anchored in China, and then they extend seemingly effortlessly uh, across across vast spaces. And this is. This is the, the typical view of, or this is our typical view of BRI. This is one way in which BRI is popularly uh, assessed and described. And on the right-hand side, you can see uh, that same map, uh, which is being localized in Pakistan. And this is the map of what is known as the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is one of six economic corridors on BRI. And if you map then towards the top of map, towards the north you can see how uh, there's a, a corridor which is entering into Pakistan uh, and that's actually the region that I'm going to be talking about and that's sometimes described as the gateway of B 
PLI or the gateway of the China-Pakistan economic corridor. And if you then sort of cast your eyes in the southward direction, and that's not a region that I'm going to be discussing in any great detail in this, in this talk, uh, you'll see that the corridors seem to make their way uh, through Pakistan all the way down and they converge in the um, southwestern part of the country in a, in a port called Gavadar, uh, which once again is seen as uh, an extremely important uh, place as far as BRI in Pakistan is concerned. So the Karakoram Mountains where this talk, where my research and what I'll be sharing is, 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 is located and on the other end, uh, we, have, we have Gavadar. And with, with both of these, what I want to say is that if you, if you look at maps such as these, whether they're BRI maps or maps of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, they give us some sense of how planners might be thinking about BRI spatialization. Uh, but there's another perspective, uh, which is to be gleaned if we actually move uh, onto the ground. And this brings me to what I'm going to be arguing. This is, this is essentially the pitch uh, for the talk. And what I, want to, what I want to do today is demonstrate how BRI builds on a history of connectivity across state boundaries. So in other words, what I'm suggesting is that connectivity itself is not new and BRI in fact might be the latest chapter in a much longer history of connectivity. Um, and uh, so in my research uh, in the Karakoram, uh, in my research on the, on the Pamir, which would be the mountain ranges on uh, the Chinese side of the border, and then of course, northward in Central Asia as well. Uh, one of the things that I'm struck by is the way in which BRI simply follows as the latest chapter. So, so Increasingly, it appears to me that BRI is not, is not something that's, that's entirely new, but there's a much, much longer history of connecti connectivity over here. But there is one key difference, and that's one of the things that I want to underscore in this talk. And that is that prior to BRI, and when I say prior to BRI, let's say that we're talking from the late 19th century up until the early years of the 21st century. So prior to BRI, when we talk about connectivity across the Karakoram Mountains between the region that is today uh, Pakistan and the region that became the People's Republic of China, we're talking about grounded networks. And when I say grounded networks, what I'm suggesting is that these are, these are tangible. These could be community networks. These could be colonial networks. Uh, these could be networks that presented uh, as Cold War alliance systems. And later on, and this is something that I will spend a little bit of time talking about as well, uh, there can be networks between individuals who represent institutions. And probably sounds a little confusing, but I'll speak about that specifically uh, with regard to the establishment of the port, uh, the dry port. But what happens since BRI is that the networks appear to become more nodal and they appear to become more stretched out. And instead, what we start seeing is that uh, there is a sort of discursive capital mobility uh, regarding nation state boundaries and normative administrative regulations. So in other words, one of the things that changes after BRI is that whereas previously the networks that existed prior to BRI were connecting individuals. Now it seems like they're more nodal and they're about capital flows uh, with sort of disregard for nation state boundaries, uh, if you may. Uh, so that's, that's, the, that's, that's essentially what I'm going to try and argue in this, in this talk. So the first thing that I want to do is uh, talk a little bit about the, the, the border. Uh, the image that you're seeing uh, on your screen right now, this is, this is uh, a, an image uh, from the village of Mizgar. And uh, I'll speak a little bit more about Mizgar in, in, in just a minute. But um, Mizgar was important because this is uh, traditionally where the route used to cross from China, from the Pamir into, into the Karakoram. And uh, the route has subsequently shifted, the route has, the route has moved. But when we talk about connectivity between 
what was then British India and uh, the Qing Empire in the 19th century, in the early part of the 20th century, the Qing Empire, of course, became uh, Republican China. It would have gone past this particular village. So, so this is, it's a, it's a, it's a historic village uh, in that regard. Um, and, and this gives you sort of a slightly clearer idea of the region that uh, I'm looking at. So, so what's marked as Gilgit Baltistan on this map, Gilgit Baltistan is the name that's given to the administrative region. Uh, in this talk, I'm referring it as I'm referring to it as uh, as the Karakoram. Um, and and just one or two things that I want to point out before I I, I go I, I go further. Um, if you if you sort of look a little bit to the left, uh, you can actually you can actually see Mizgar on the map. Uh, it's at the end of where one of the red lines is darting. Um, and then if you move back a little bit, uh, you see a place. Uh, called SOST, S-O-S-T, uh, and that's, uh, that's where the bazaar is located, that's where the port is located. Uh, and the red line that is running past SOST, and then before the turning for Misgar starts moving in the eastward direction, uh, this is the Karakoram Highway. Uh, and the Karakoram Highway is a highway that connects Pakistan and China. It crosses the Khunjra Pass, about 4,700 meters. Uh, and this highway uh, became crossable by motorized vehicles in the 1970s. And it's, 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 it's this route that BRI is then taking when it's entering into Pakistan. Uh, and once again, this is, it's a high mountain region. It's a, 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 it's, a, it's a sparsely populated region. And it's this region that I'm essentially describing as unremarkable corner in Asia unremarkable uh, distant corner in Asia, uh, certainly in so far as uh, capital volumes are concerned, trade volumes are concerned, because as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, the large majority of trade that is coming from China to Pakistan is coming by uh, the seaborne routes. So I'll just very, very briefly run through this. I know the slide looks very busy uh, and I don't want to spend too much time on this. Um, and, 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 and go into too much detail, but you know, this is by way of saying that um, the, the, in the 19th century and then uh, into the 20th century, uh, we do find that this area is extremely networked. Uh, it's networked uh, insofar as uh, connectivity with um, Afghanistan is concerned. It's networked as far as connectivity across the Karakoram with Republican China is concerned, uh, first Qing China and then Republican China is concerned. And of course, there's also routes which would connect it um, to what would, uh, well, to what in 19th century would have been Russian Central Asia and which later on uh, became, became Soviet Central Asia as well. So, so this, is, this is sort of this, this map uh, gives one a reasonably good idea of the myriad routes that were connecting the Karakoram to uh, China, Central Asia, uh, and what is now uh, Afghanistan as well. Um, and the, the, the strategic importance of this region uh, is also going to increase uh, at the end of the 19th century. Uh, and this is, of course, a result of uh, rivalry with the uh, with the Soviet Union. So this is, this is one of the areas where the so-called uh, great game is being played out. It's an area where the British had uh, stationed officers on special duty uh, whose job was to obtain early and accurate information about these, these frontier districts. And then of course, uh, at the end of the 19th century, uh, they were incorporated into a colonial administrative network. Once again, the larger argument over here is that uh, there, are, there are networks uh, which are linking the Karakoram region with the colonial machinery that is set up in India. And at the same time, they're also being linked with initially Qing China and then later on Republican China. Uh, there's the establishment of a postal service in 1909, and this postal service is connecting British India to Kashgar. Uh, there's the establishment of a post office in Misgar, uh, the 
sort of image I had uh, in the title slide, the border that was that was the village where the post office was established in 1918. Uh, KD Fort is established in 1933, and uh, there's there's regular mail service uh, across the Karakoram between the uh, consulate that the government of India maintained in Kashka and uh, Misgar and then from Misgar uh, down to uh, other administrative uh, centers. So here is an example of a network uh, which is which is localized and which is grounded. So this is it's a it's a it's a colonial network, if you may. So so it's networked to the larger colonial machinery in India, and we find that the network extends uh, all the way up to to Kashgar as well. Um, this is another example of a network, uh, and the, the sort of image on the left is uh, from the from the uh, personal account of the last or one of the last Mirs of Hunza. Uh, Mir means uh, princely rule, and eventually princely rule would be established. But we have uh, accounts, early twentieth century accounts, left by uh, the princes of the local courts. And ostensibly, they're under the control of the British after the region has been incorporated into the colonial networks. But what these, what these accounts reveal is actually very, very interesting. And they reveal that the local people still enjoyed cross-border mobility. So the pastoralists could, could move with their livestock from, once again, what is today Pakistan over to China. Uh, there's also accounts of how uh, if there was a wedding that was taking place, then uh, the well-to-do people might go to Kashgar and purchase uh, wedding finery. Uh, finished goods are moving back and forth across the border as well. And the point that I'm getting at over here is that once again, we're finding that there's a there's a tangible network. There's a network that's very much grounded in place. So we have the colonial networks, and then uh, we have the elite networks. And in both cases, we find that there is cross-border uh, mobilities. Um, we, we find something. And then in, in 1947, Pakistan becomes uh, independent. Uh, 1949, the People's Republic of China is established. And for about for about 20 years, the border is closed. And I've, I've written about that in a recent paper. And then in 1969, uh, as, a, as a confidence building measure, uh, we find that trade resumes uh, across the Karakoram Pamir watershed. Uh, and it's taking the old route. It's taking the route past Misgar. And this image, in fact, is uh, when the first caravan from China uh, crossed over in August 1969, carrying goods. Uh, and as you can see over here, there was about 50 camels and 14 horsemen who, who came with the camels. It's sort of written about uh, in, in the local press in a very dramatic way. And uh, they describe how they're crossing a high altitude pass and, and the conditions are very, very rough. But they're, 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 it's, it's, it's written, it's scripted in the Bandung lexicon, which is why I'm calling it a Cold War Alliance or trade, which is representative of Cold War Alliances. Um, and you know what they're what they're sort of doing over here is that they're uh, China and Pakistan are, are are reaching out, engaging in a confidence building measure uh, at a time uh, when uh, the Cold War in Asia is picking up, uh, when uh, when 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 both sides are feeling uh, slightly uh, isolated uh, insofar as relations with India are concerned, insofar as relations with uh, the United States uh, uh, are concerned. So the point that I'm making over here uh, is that this is yet another type of grounded network. Here you have relations between two states representing as localized trade. And you know, if you sort of see it the, on the, on the right-hand side of the slide, you know what you're what you're looking at in terms of what was actually being exchanged, and there's detailed lists of what was coming every year, and the list shifts from time to time. These are goods which are required on the other side of the border, but the story they tell is one of geopolitical confidence building. So you have sort of a larger frame, which is geopolitics, but a very very localized uh, network, and then once again we could see these localized networks. 
uh, continue into the 1980s uh, and the 1990s uh, as well. Once again, taking the form of border trade, uh, where you would have people who would, you would have people who are domiciled in the Karakoram region in Pakistan, they'd travel over land, uh, they'd go as far as Kashkar, uh, which is the first of the major towns in Western China, and they'd purchase uh, low cost items, uh, shuttle them back and sell them uh, in border markets. And this is the type of trade that we see uh, increasing in quantity more and more people, uh, more and more local people are participating uh, in this, this, this border trade. And it, it accompanies, it accompanies uh, economic liberalization uh, in China, which of course begins in the 1980s and the 1990s. But one of the things that's really curious is that while all of this is happening, there is no official port in the Karakoram Mountains. So what would happen is that people would um, take local transport back, which was in the form of a bus, which ran once daily from either side. And then once they reached the town of Sus, which is the first town that you would reach once you had crossed from China into Pakistan, the goods and the passengers would be offloaded in a vacant lot. And that's where uh, immigration would take place. That's where customs would be done. Um, and, and, and what we find is that all the way into the 21st century, uh, so in other words, until very, very recently, uh, there isn't a port. Uh, so, so this is all being done, um, not informally, uh, but, but uh, there isn't a formal institution uh, which would process uh, the people and the goods which are, which are coming into, into the country. Which brings me uh, to the second part of this talk, uh, which is uh, the establishment of the dry port at Sosk. Um, this image is taken inside the dry port. Uh, I took this photograph in 2012. Uh, and and so as you can as you can make out, uh, this is uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a it's an established port facility. So we're no longer talking about uh, the goods and the people which are being spilled in an empty lot and then immigration and customs clearance is taking place over there. You know, just looking at this image, you can see right away that we're talking about the establishment of a formal institution. And then on the right, you can see um, a container truck. Uh, and if you look closely on these images see that they've got Chinese license plates. So this is cross-border cargo. So this is now something different from what I had been describing earlier, which was local people crossing the border and peddling goods uh, back into Pakistan. This is something uh, uh, which is significantly more formalized uh, than what used to happen in the 1980s, the 1990s, and then into the early part of the 21st century uh, as well. Now, the port opens in 2006. Uh, planning for the port begins in 2002. And this is part of uh, China's going out, uh, which is when Chinese companies and Chinese um, SOEs were encouraged to invest uh, overseas. And without going into, into too much detail, um, one of the things that I want to underscore is that the establishment of the dry port itself uh, represented networks of a different type. Um, these were highly personalized networks, but networks nonetheless, and networking is, is, at, the, is at the center of the story. Now, there is two parties uh, which will come together and establish the dry port in 2006. Um, one of them, one of the parties, the lar one of the parties is Sinotrans Xinjiang, and Sinotrans Xinjiang is a subsidiary of Sinotrans. Uh, Sinotrans is the largest uh, logistics integrator within within China. So Sinotrans Xinjiang is going to provide the funding. Uh, and they're going to provide the funding to a local collective, which goes by the name of the Silk Route Dry Port Trust. Um, and the Silk Route Dry Port Trust is going to provide the land on which this port is going to be built. 
And together, Sinotrans, Xinjiang, and the Trust are supposed to work together. And they're supposed to run the port. They're supposed to manage the port. And there's a 60-40 there's a agreement uh, insofar as uh, the ownership structure of the port is concerned. Now, I want to speak uh, for a few minutes about these socialized uh, networks. Uh, Sinotrans Xinjiang relies on a, on a broker uh, who has, uh, he's, he's highly, highly networked and he has insider knowledge. Uh, and uh, his name is Yuan Jianmin. And uh, Yuan Jianmin is, has, 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 is, is said to have made over 150 visits to Pakistan since the 1980s. And uh, he's not only representing Sinotrans Xinjiang. So if you, if you look for Yuan in media accounts, uh, what you find is that during his different visits to Pakistan, he's representing uh, different institutions in China. And the reason why he is, I think, able to represent different institutions in China is because he has insider information. Uh, he knows the local norms. Uh, he knows the local traditions. Um, he he has knowledge that is essentially for this type of cross-border uh, brokerage. And the other thing that's very uh, thought-provoking about the way Yuan is described in the press, described in the media, is that whenever he's meeting with officials in Pakistan, he's always promising development and, and he's always signaling forward. He's always pointing towards, towards the future. So Yuan is, is uh, uh, sort of a broker who is highly, highly networked and, and, and he's essential to the establishment of the port. Now, there's a broker on the other side as well. Uh, and the broker on the other side is someone who is a descendant from hereditary uh, families in North Pakistan. Uh, so he would be a descendant of the Mirs uh, whom I had talked about earlier. Uh, he's someone who has close ties to the military regime and uh, he's able to pressurize the local people. Uh, to give up village land and he's promising to make them trustees uh, and he's promising them uh, dividends. Now, this is uh, a satellite image of the region that I'm talking about. So, so you know, down here you have uh, the village of Sust uh, and this um, is the bazaar that I'll, I'll, I'll get to in just a few minutes. And these are uh, surrounding villages. Uh, so there's Sos, there's Hussainabad, there's Fudabad. And up here, this is the dry port. Uh, so to get to the dry port, you would drive through the bazaar and then circle up to the dry port. And this was all village land. This land was owned by people in the surrounding villages. And the, the person that I was talking about who heads the trust, Mir Ghazanfar Ali Khan, uh, or Khan for, 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 for shorthand, he's able to convince the villagers that look, you know, give up this land, let's use it to build a port and you will get dividends as uh, a trustee. That doesn't happen. Um, the, the, the port is marred in controversy from, from the very beginning. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a long list of things that start going wrong, but pretty much from the time the port is opened in 2006, uh, we find that loans are being taken from a bank, which are never repaid. Uh, eventually, the villagers uh, clue into the fact that, well, we're not ever going to get dividends, and they start accusing uh, Khan, uh, who is the chairperson of the Silk Road Trust of land grabbing and they take the leadership to court. Um, the court shifts ownership of the trust to a competing party. Uh, the, Chinese parters, the Chinese parties refuse to work with the new parties. There's um, a massive flare up between uh, the Chinese partners and the Pakistani partners. And uh, what we find is that uh, the, 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 the controversies at the port uh, continue to increase with, with time. 
And then this lands up in the court, and the court decides that neither the trust nor Sinotrans uh, Xinjiang is going to have control over the port. They're instead going to give management of the port to a branch of the military. And Sinotrans Xinjiang uh, withdraws from the SUSP port. And the curious thing about this is that it's happening just at the point in time when BRI is taking off. So as I conclude this part of the talk, I want to underscore two things over here. One is the fact that once again, we're, we're, we're seeing the importance of localized networks, um, deep insider knowledge, uh, people from different sides of the border initially willing to work together to establish a dry port, regardless of the fact that it, 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 the, the, the partnership doesn't work out. Uh, once again, I think what we're seeing over here is the importance of personalized networks. Um, but the other curious thing that I want to flag is the fact that just as BRI is picking up, we find that Sinotrans Xinjiang uh, withdraws from the region. And that's very curious. And that's curious because this is supposedly the gateway of BRI into, into Pakistan. So it's somewhat odd that you know, just as uh, BRI is gaining traction, just as there is talk about increased connectivity between Pakistan and China, you find the key logistics provider, which was which had controlling shares of the dry port, is moving out of that region. It's withdrawing from the region. And interestingly enough, uh, the next time uh, one finds mention, mention of Yuan Jianbing, um, who was the broker of uh, who was the broker for Sinotrans Xinjiang, the next time we find mention of him is when uh, the is, is, is when the China-Pakistan uh, economic corridor is opened, which is to say that you have a convoy which travels from the land border at Hujrab in the Karakaram all the way through the country to Gavadar, uh, and the first ship uh, leaves Gavadar. So, so, and, and, and uh, so at Gavadar, uh, you have uh, you have the Pakistani Prime Minister, you have uh, the Chief of Army Staff, and of course uh, you have you have Yuan as well. So that that is essentially demonstrating how you, we're leaving behind something which is very localized, which is very much grounded in place, uh, and the attention has now shifted to uh, sort of a the China-Pakistan economic corridor as a whole uh, in, its, in its broader specialization. So, so now it's no longer a question of running a, a particular port in this distant part of the country, but the, 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 the frame all of a sudden has become much, much bigger and much more uh, ambitious. Um, and finally, uh, in the final part of this talk, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the bazaar that's by the dry port. So, so this is this is an image that uh, I took in 2016. And uh, sort of, if you go down this road uh, for another 75 kilometers, you would, you would reach Kunjarab, the border uh, between Pakistan and China. And if you followed the road um, sort of out of the frame towards the right-hand side, uh, you, would, you would come to the dry port. And the other, uh, the other thing that I want to point out, which is, which is fairly obvious, uh, is the fact that the, the shops that you're seeing in this image uh, are empty uh, and, and, and in fact unoccupied. And the same is true for this, for this border market. And the border market doesn't really extend very much beyond what you're looking at uh, in this image. It's, it's, it's really, it's, it's barely a kilometer long. It's the sort of thing you know, where one would say that if you, if you blink, you will miss it. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a small market, it's a nondescript market, and one of the things I find curious is the fact that this is the first market that one would, one would reach if one was coming from, from China. So from the very outset, it's anomalous that there is so little activity which is, which is taking place in this market. Um, the, 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 market the market emerges in the early 1990s. So uh, I had mentioned earlier that in the 1980s, 
peddling across the border had begun. Uh, and by the 1990s, there's a, there's a small market uh, sort of in this, in this locale. Uh, and, and it was never busy, but it was an indicator of cross-border familial ethnic ties, uh, if you may. Now, uh, sort of speaking more specifically about what's been happening there recently, uh, in, and I've, I've, I've been to this particular market uh, for the purpose of gauging connectivity, for the purpose of figuring out what's going on. I've been there about five or six times in the last, uh, in the last 10 years. Um, and in 2016, <clears throat> I actually, uh, with a research assistant, went from, from, from shop to shop to shop to shop, and we, um, we, we, we counted the number of shops. We, we made a map of the market as well. And uh, what we found at that time was that there was about 240 shops and uh, about a third of them uh, uh, were, were empty or they were actually, they were actually never, uh, never occupied. That might be fine. And one could, one could even say that, look, I mean, this is, this is speculation. This is simply people hedging on the fact that at some later point in time, uh, there is going to be greater trade between China and Pakistan. So, you know, one could, one could work with that assumption. But what's also very curious is that the traders, the shopkeepers, they say that trading has actually declined uh, since, since BRI. And what they're saying is that uh, with BRI, a new border regime has been put in place, which makes it difficult to self-import goods. And, this leads me to conclude that, um, or this helps me move towards the conclusion that BRI is, is, is nodal. So what you have is mobility and connectivity between two points and the places in between small border markets, uh, such as Sost, for example, uh, they don't really feature uh, into how, how BRI is, is actually being, um, planned and envisioned. And one of the questions that I, I, I usually pose to uh, local people is, well, how have you benefited uh, since BRI? And invariably, the answer is um, that it hasn't benefited the local people up until now. And uh, the, 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 the sort of best response that I got was, was from a, a long-term acquaintance of mine, someone whom I first met more than 20 years ago. And he said that, uh, you know, we just, we just sit here watching the big cargo roll past us. And, you know, other people say that, you know, we're just sitting here watching the, watching the containers roll past. And <clears throat> that's why I thought these two images were, were, were kind of um, um, revealing of, 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 of the market um, at, so, and the two realities of the market. So the volume of of, of, of trucks, uh, the number of uh, vehicles coming into, into, into Pakistan from China has increased substantially. So I think it was 2017, uh, I sort of remember just, just uh, standing in the, in the bazaar and just walking these, watching these trucks roll by. That's, that's the day I took this image on the right. Um, and, and during the summer months, uh, uh, and during days when the weather is good and the traffic can flow, really, I mean, there's there's one truck and then another truck and then another truck. So there's a there's a steady stream stream of, of of vehicles passing by, but they're all they're all going right through, uh, both literally and of course figuratively, which <clears throat> is why I think the image on the on the left is uh, also revealing and uh, at the same time. Uh, illustrative of uh, the other facet of, 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 of this border market, you know, and sort of if the image on the right is, is, is perhaps a more typical image of connectivity, what we might assume with, uh, with economic corridors, which uh, with, with, with the movement of heavy cargo, with the movement of heavy cargo, uh, then the image on the left is um, the other reality on the ground, uh, where you know you're looking at a sleepy, completely nondescript place uh, with uh, very little happening uh, in terms of uh, commerce or connectivity. So um, to to wrap up uh, this this talk, um, 
what we find over here, uh, what we find if we situate ourselves in, in, in uh, North Pakistan, which is what I've described as uh, a distant corner of Asia, is that there is, there is a longer history of connectivity uh, that dates back to the, to the 19th century. Um, and, and, and I like to think of BRI as the, the, the latest chapter in this longer history of connectivity. But there is a key difference, which is what I'm, what I'm, um, what I'm arguing today, and which is what I'm trying to work through as far as my own uh, research is concerned. And that is that previously, what we saw were grounded networks. And as I've, as I've tried to illustrate uh, in this talk, uh, these grounded networks were of, were of different types. They could be colonial networks, community networks, uh, networks representing Cold War alliances. Uh, and finally, with the establishment of the port, uh, just as China's going out was, was beginning, uh, networks between individuals who represented and brokered for different institutions. But since BRI, what we're seeing is that how we think about connectivity is becoming far more uh, nodal. And the, the, the spaces in between uh, are, uh, are, are, are not being affected uh, directly by BRI. And uh, instead, uh, what we're looking at is the creation of um, new types of spaces for uh, transnational capital movement. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, stop here and I look forward to um, questions and uh, comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hassan. That was fascinating, uh, really. Uh, to learn about these spaces and how uh, there's a differential sort of an impact across the same sort of an area. Uh, so we now move to uh, questions. Uh, please, as I said, uh, raise your hand, unmute yourself, uh, introduce yourself, and please ask your question. I'm still waiting for the first question. So I'll, while people make up their mind, maybe I can go ahead and uh, ask you. See, uh, we have a head hand here and go ahead, Fred. I think I'm unmuted now. Can you hear yes, me? Yes, you are, Fred, we can hear you. Okay, I'm sorry I came in very late because of computer problems, but I really enjoyed what I heard. Unfortunately, my question may have been covered when you began. Uh, I began when you were uh, uh, transitioning from the end of the colonial period. And I was wondering, but you were also talking about the exchange of things for weddings and that like. Does that mean that there was some connection across this area for the last 300 and 500, um, 2000 years? So is this really a, an old network that's now being transformed? So there is, um, <clears throat> that's, th thank you for that. I mean, it's, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, so there is, there, is, there is certainly cross-border mobility that goes back a long, long time. Um, in a course that I'm teaching right now, uh, we're reading uh, Valerie Hansen's uh, account of the Silk Road in the first 1,000 years of the Common Era. And uh, she's describing uh, the movement of people um, following the same routes that I'm talking about uh, in the 19th and the, and the 20th century. So certainly uh, these routes have been traveled, these routes have been, have been traversed, uh, and that's been happening uh, through much of the common era. Uh, and when we, when we, when we get to, uh, when we get to the late 19th century uh, and the early 20th century, uh, once again, what we're, what we're looking at is reasonably frequent uh, crossing of the border. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, these, these, these networks in that sense, I mean, if we, if we think of a network as 
representing a pathway which people will use frequently uh, to, to engage in a small trade, uh, to reinforce kinship ties, uh, then I would certainly say that uh, these networks are, they're, they're, they're tenuous, they're deep, they go back uh, quite a bit in time. Thank you. Yep, my pleasure. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Professor Womack, please unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, well, it was very much a pleasure to listen to your account of the uh, of the border realities uh, in northern Pakistan. I've spent uh, a fair amount of time in the 1990s on the China-Vietnam border, mm -hmm. and there are many similarities uh, in the in the situation. What is local and what is international are two different things. I remember uh, uh, your voice uh, broke up, uh, Professor Womack. We can't hear you. Nice. And I'm yeah, you're back now. Uh, so, so we missed, uh, sorry, we missed uh, some part of your talk because your voice. Oh, uh, okay. My, my connection is always bad. I, I share that with Pakistani villagers, perhaps. Um, but um, in any case, they were selling rice, Chinese rice, on the Vietnamese side of the border. And I was astonished because Vietnam is one of the world's top exporters of rice. And I thought, aha, mm -hmm. you know, there's some sort of other trade going on. And so I asked the people at the, at the stand, why are you buying? Why are you buying and selling Chinese rice? And their answer was, it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if they're going to, when you're on a border, you can go to this store or the other store. And it just happens to be that one store's in China and one store's in Vietnam. Yeah. You know, so uh, it's a very particular connection at the border. And at least in Vietnam and China during the 1990s and beyond, there was a uh, a system of uh, special allowances for border traders and border trade within a certain distance of the border that I thought was a very nice accommodation of border realities versus international realities. I wonder if you have that same kind of, if that persists, because I've been back to the border, oh, in 20 years now. So. So yeah, I mean, thank you for that. I mean, uh, absolutely, it's the it's a similar. Uh, it used to be a similar arrangement. So in 1986, uh, Pakistan and China signed a border trading agreement, which basically meant that people who were domiciled in the border areas could cross overland, travel as far as Kashgar, uh, purchase merchandise over there, and then bring it back. And uh, until recently, one could bring back. Um, officially up to 300 kilograms of goods uh, without paying any tariffs on that. And obviously people would, uh, they would, they would <laughs> substantially undervalue the volume of goods that they were bringing back as well by way of avoiding paying tariffs on what they were self-importing. Uh, but that's become much more difficult under BRI. Uh, and what the people are now saying is that it's no longer viable to engage in cross-border trade. And anecdotally, what I've been told is that around about 2014, 2015, uh, 3,500 people in North Pakistan had these uh, border trading permits. Uh, and then the next year, the number halved. And then the year after that, the number halved yet again. And so one of the things that they're saying, and this is of course rhetorical, but I think there is a kernel of truth to it, is that, well, if BRI is supposed to benefit us. Why is it that less and less people are applying for these 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 border trading uh, permits? So, which uh, again leads me, or you know, nudges me in the direction of concluding that that with BRI, perhaps we're looking at a completely different type of connectivity. Maybe the small trader doesn't really feature uh, as far as BRI is concerned. You know, maybe maybe the scale has just it's, it's become so grand, it's become so large that uh, cross-border trading 
making a profit of say, you know, let's say you know, $300, $400 per trip. You know, that's, that's not really part of the schema anymore. And in terms of uh, the, the, the goods that were shuttled across, uh, up to 10 years ago, 15 years ago, <clears throat> if you walked into a small store in North Pakistan uh, and uh, you picked up, say, for example, a small sachet of detergent or a, a fruit juice or something, something uh, a, a bar of soap, there's a, there's a good chance that it might have been manufactured in China and brought over across the border by someone in a, in a, in a, in a duffel bag or a sack and you know, the person was just selling this. Um, and I have some images, unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't use them in this presentation of, of, of people just displaying what they have brought over from China on, on, on tables and you know, you might find a, an odd assortment of electrical pliers and flip flops and washing detergent and you know, basically whatever that you could get a good deal on, carry across, sell it, make a little bit of a profit, finance the next trip, come back again. But but that that was that was declining already um, under BRI, and then since since COVID nineteen, that's just completely evaporated. Thank you. So um, while we wait for other questions, Hassan, there was one thing that I was really interested in, and that has more to do with. Uh, my own research, uh, which is this, uh, the notion, the, the point that you mentioned about uh, a more centralized sort of control over the port, um, as opposed to the more uh, decentralized or locally driven sort of a control. Yeah. Um, so how, how does that sort of play out? And I, I mean that not on the policy uh, level, but how does that play out on the ground, so as to say, because one of the things that's interesting about your work is the grounded nature, right? Mm. So it brings in the voice of the little guys when you talk about traders mm. and you talk about mm. this mm. sort of uh, personalized networks. Uh, again, one of the things that we're witnessing with the BRI is that because the amounts of money that you mentioned as well uh, in your answer, that, that is to be made has increased. Um, mm the number of actors who are entering into these spaces is mm. becoming much more centralized. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. how does that play out at the local level in terms of people's perceptions? And I think I got a part of your answer from the last slide you showed or, or a couple of slides ago, mm. uh, where you talked about your local uh, interlocutor mm. and what he said. Uh, yeah. But what's, yeah. what's the views? Because again, the Mir's, this is very interesting because I, I went to Hunza in 2009 and at that time there were lots of talk about, uh, you know, the, the port needs to be taken away from the Mir, etc. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that was big news at that time when I went there. Uh, yeah. So I'd like yeah. to take, take your opinion on, on this. Uh, yeah, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question, Tayyip, and, and I don't have, I don't have a very precise answer. So, so and so, so what I was referring to is the fact that in 2016, uh, the NLC gets control of the, the port. Uh, and the NLC is the National Logistics Cell, uh, which comes under, it's, it comes under the, 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 the Pakistani military umbrella. So, and, and you know, in that sense, this, this development too is kind of interesting because when the controversy over the port lands up in the court, uh, the court decides that, you know, it's not going to be the trust that gets the port, it's not going to be Sino Trans Xinjiang, but it's the, it's the national logistics cell. Um, so, <clears throat> my, my sense is that, uh, and so, so, my sense is that on the ground, and again, I'm saying this very cautiously because I, I actually don't know for certain, but my sense is that on the ground, uh, relatively little would have changed. Uh, one of the things that's uh, interesting about uh, the port and the bazaar, and I've written about this in one of my papers, is how a lot of the labor that works at the port actually lives in the bazaar. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a very curious place because it's not a bazaar that's linked to any of the villages. Uh, it's two kilometers away from Sust. It's sometimes called Sust Bazaar, but in actual fact, it, it was an area that was developed by someone called Afiat Khan in the 1980s, and hence the bazaar became Afiat Abad. Uh, and then within this bazaar, you have 
you have dormitories which are used by the labor that works at the port. My sense is that that dynamic doesn't really change, but it is a good question. And when I when I go back there, which actually might be might be very soon, because you know I, I somehow you know recently I just find myself ending up there every year. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly follow up on that. I, it's, it's it's a nice place to go to. You know, it's it's, it's you know, absolutely. It's it's you know field work <laughs> in a. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's the yeah. it's the benefits of field work in in a <laughs> in a in a rather spectacular setting. Yeah, true, true, true. Uh, so we're waiting for another question. Please do ask your questions. We're we're waiting uh, for you to ask. Uh, Hassan, please go ahead and raise your hand. Ah, we have another question. Yes, yes, Professor Womack, go ahead. Um, well, uh, let me ask a different sort of question, uh, and that is, it seems to me that from the point of view of a shipper in China who's basically looking at a market or a market purchaser, wholesale purchaser in, in Pakistan, in, Pun in Lahore, wherever, uh, they would look on any type of time spent or anything that they had to do on the border would be a transaction cost to them. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in a sense, the, no, the nodes thin themselves out and become more distant because of the efficiency of the system and the avoidance of unnecessary costs. And so the border loses as an unnecessary cost if there's a stop or if there's a transfer from one kind of truck to another kind of truck or even if there's a, a, a even if the customs uh uh the border loses Oh, we, we, that, we left it again. loses its significance. Yeah, go ahead, sorry, we, we stopped hearing you in between. I'm sorry? So we couldn't hear you in between, sorry. That, that's oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, no, no, I will have to use sign language, I suppose. <laughs> no, the, 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 the border gets cut out because yeah it is an unnecessary cost mm -hmm. to large-scale transportation and so it goes kashgar or even shanghai yeah. to guadar you know yeah. rather than than uh that transport its belt and road initiative policies versus an evolution of trade. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, I can, uh, Professor Womack, I, I, I didn't uh, sort of catch catch all of that, but I can I can certainly uh, try and respond to it. Uh, and I think that sort of even <clears throat> with the establishment of the port, uh, the agreement for which was inked in 2002 and it finally opens in 2006 one of the things that they uh, one of the things that they claim to be doing or they hope to be doing is to make trade more efficient mm -hmm. so pakistan's uh, uh, head of state at that time was uh, general musharraf and he actually came to the port when it was inaugurated and uh, he talked about uh, how for trading is going to become much more streamlined, how they'll be able to process goods much more quickly. Uh, and you know, he obviously had grandiose plans about how they're going to increase the capacity of the trade multifold. And as far as the old port is concerned, which actually wasn't a port at all, it was just an empty lot. Uh, one of the criticisms against that was that goods would come there, they'd be, you know, they'd be thrown out in the lot, they would take days and days to clear, sometimes. Uh, longer than that. Uh, so, so definitely uh, there is this discourse of efficiency uh, that we find as far as the establishment of the board is concerned. Uh, and my, my, 
my guess is that that discourse of actually not guess, but I can say this with, with a degree of, 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 of confidence, but with the, with the national logistics cell, uh, that uh, discourse of efficiency is uh, sort of ratcheted up a notch. Uh, uh, the National Logistics Cell and the Frontier Works Organization uh, are both construction slash logistics arms of, of the military, and they've got very snazzy websites. I mean, I've, I've visited their websites on a number of occasions. And uh, one of the things that, that, that they, they, they promise is uh, efficiency in moving goods. Uh, they run other dry ports in the country as well. Uh, they're engaged in heavy transportation, tolling. Uh, so certainly, I think the, 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 the discourse of efficiency is, is, is an important one. Uh, go ahead, Eric. Uh, go ahead. Uh, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. All right. Thank you very much. First off, I've, I've really enjoyed everything. It's been wonderful. Um, I'm just curious, actually, about the implications, if you've seen any, for like ethnic or religious or other subnational identities, since clearly this is impacting um, the local region's relative uh, uh, political economy. Like, is it is it having some sort of thing, especially in light of like other like international or, or regional developments? I'm just curious, like any impressions you have. Thank you. Uh, it's an yeah, no, it's an excellent question, and it's one that um, <clears throat> one that I've I've I've, I've tried to engage with uh, uh, elsewhere. So, one of the uh, so so uh, early uh, sort of in the in the talk, I talked about um, I talked about local networks, uh, and um, one of the things that one would hear quite frequently is uh, people on the Pakistan side of the border. Uh, saying that they have kin uh, on the on the other side of the border, and in particular the uh, Tajik or Bahi speaking people claiming that they have kin uh, right on the other side in uh, Tashkurgan uh, in westernmost uh, China, and uh, they used to speak about their kin with a fair degree of affinity even though very often they couldn't actually name anyone. So, you know, they would, they would talk about their kin, they would talk about their family on the other side. And, and, and you know, these, these were long-term acquaintances of mine and I'd be like, okay, well, you know, who's there? You know, give me, you know, give me a concrete example. How are you related to them? And, and, and they, they, they couldn't. But there is that, that idea of kinship by virtue of an imagined history, an imagined shared history in the 19th century, the early 20th century. And of course, the fact that they speak the same language. Speaking the same language is uh, profoundly important. Uh, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a term that one would use in Urdu, Hamzaban. So you know, the fact that you, you share a tongue, you, you sort of automatically gives you uh, a very high degree of affinity. And what what, what, what I sort of try to suggest in this paper is that as these cross-border mobilities become less, uh, that affinity across the border, even if it was imagined, uh, begins to change as well. So, you know, in that sense, what we, what we see over here is a transformation in how local people think about bordering as well, um, and 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 it's a it's a gradual transformation, uh, but certainly one that over a couple of decades I've been able to to discern. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. It's so. Um... Do we have any other questions? Again, while we're waiting for questions, and I'll pester uh, you a little more. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the, again, uh, so the volume of trade is most definitely one of the things that, that you showed is the inhospitable nature uh, of the terrain uh, in many ways, which sort of contributes to the reduction in volume of trade between uh, Pakistan, the mainland, so as to say, and this, peripheral region. Uh, how does that play out uh, over time, especially with the bazaar and the labor that we talked about? Uh, because I know that in the winters, 
the port and the port is closed. Uh, so then with, and when, when one thinks about capitalist accumulation, uh, then it's not perhaps the best sort of route towards this massive, uh, you know, or, or more organized capital accumulation in the way uh, as perhaps other borders which are more hospitable, for example, the Pakistan-India border uh, or the Pakistan-Iran border for that matter yeah. uh, could be in terms of land crossing, not, not in terms of the seaborne trade, which of course has its own economies of scale, etc. Uh, so in this sort of a broader imaginary, how does that, the, the terrain itself or the physical infrastructure, how does that play out, uh, you know, as these uh, networks, you know, sort of become thicker in many ways? Uh, yeah, you yeah, know, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. Um, so, and then I, I think, you know, I'd have two responses to that. So my, 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 my standard response would have been, you know, if you'd asked me this question, say five years ago, <clears throat> or, or perhaps even less than that, three years ago, I would have said that, um, this this border is never going to be used for substantial traffic, uh, and and I would have said that uh, uh, it's it's simply too tenuous a terrain. But uh, I have seen a sharp increase in the volume of goods coming across the border, uh, and of course. You know, one one needs to be cognizant of uh, you know things like the railway line to Lhasa, for example, uh, which I believe crosses five thousand meters as yeah. well. So um, it is it is certainly possible, um, and 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 a lot of the um, a lot of the uh, uh, construction material for the the Amar Basha Dam, uh, for example, has been coming over land. And that has actually still been coming even during COVID-19. So, uh, you know, otherwise the, the, the border is closed for commercial traffic, but, but, but um, construction material is still, still coming uh, across the border. And uh, not the last year, but the year before last, when I was in the Karakoram, I was actually quite astonished to see 40-foot uh, containers mm. uh, coming down the Karakoram Highway as well. Uh, once again, I don't think that was possible a few years ago, but but certainly parts of the road have been substantially widened, and <clears throat> I saw them. I saw them fairly low down uh, around Beisham. Uh, so, you know, once again, I I, I don't think it's ever good. Well, I shouldn't say that so confidently, but I doubt very much it's ever going to constitute a substantial portion of trade simply because transportation by sea is so much cheaper uh, than transportation over land. But the volume of trade has increased quite notably. And you know, one can see it. It's, it's, it's very, very visible now. It's very evident. I mean, I remember once, uh, and again, this is, this is anecdotal, but once uh, in 20, in the year 2000, the summer of 2000, uh, we, we, we exited Shimshal after 10 days and we, we, we joined the Karakoram Highway. And this is the summer uh, when there is supposed to be traffic. Yeah. And we reached the Karakoram Highway just before the border with China uh, in the middle of the day. And not a single vehicle passed until the next morning. So we actually spent the night at, uh, at a border check post. Uh, and then the next morning there was a, I think it was a, it was a bus returning empty from, from somewhere. And then we got on that. So, and now it's unthinkable. Now, obviously, I mean, these days there's a lot of tourist traffic as well. So that kind of skews what's, what's yeah. happening with these, how we think about these cross-border mobilities. But in any case, I mean, there is, there is, there is a, an exponentially larger number of uh, vehicles and cargo crossing from China than there was earlier. Right. So my last question, and if we don't have another question, I think we'll probably end. What happened to Sinotrans? So I remember reading in your paper that they were all right with whatever the court said. So oh, was yeah. it a lack of commercial objective from their side? Because that's very interesting from, for the broader BRI as well, where you have this local activism uh, from the state within these host countries, uh, which sort of makes life difficult for these Chinese firms 
to operate. So whatever happened to them, were they agree? And, and even with the NLC, uh, you know, uh, mm. did they try or did they try to, you know, sort of enter into a joint venture because that would have provided them this internationalization <clears throat> as well. So whatever happened to so, so it's a it's a it's a great question, and once again, I mean, I can only you know I can only answer that based upon the material that you know I can I can sort of find on uh, you know sort of find in public sources. So, Sinotrans said that basically, look, I mean, this is a victory for us, which, in a certain sense, it was because it was taken over by the N uh, by the by the NLC and uh, the, the 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 sort of all these CPEC projects uh, require that there's close cooperation with the with the military, with the NLC, with the FWO. And then, you know, they moved on to bigger things. I mean, they moved on to, or uh, they moved on to Gavadar, the Gavadar port, uh, opening CPEC, for example. And I think, so, so insofar as I can make sense of it, and once again, uh, the, 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 the information is limited. So really, it's just a question of, you know, one thinking, okay, well, you know, what does this actually mean? Mm. For me, one of the interesting things is that they just walked away from it. Uh, mm. It was, um, so, so it, it, it was, it was a relationship that didn't work out. Uh, it was something that, uh, it was a project that was the hallmark of uh, the first decade of China's going out. Uh, and it didn't, um, it didn't quite work the way in which it was imagined to work. So, you know, instead of holding on and, you know, letting that bad situation get worse, mm. they said that, okay, well, we're, we're, we're sort of just very happily going to, to, to walk away from it. So, and, and, and I think that, that is kind of thought provoking as well for me because it, 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 it complicates this notion of the death trap uh, what it tells you is that there will be instances when when China is going to say that we don't want to be a part of this anymore, and they just withdraw from a region. So uh, there's, I, I guess, what I'm getting at is that it illustrates that there's many ways in which, in which these type of cooperations, ventures, especially joint ventures, could actually play out. Great. That's fascinating. Thank you so much, Hassan. Thank you so much for staying up late and talking to us. No, no, it's been absolutely fascinating. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. No, Thank no, you everyone for joining in as well.